Welcome, everybody. So, we are starting for this uh, new panel with uh, some questions. Uh, and also, we remark something that has been said in the previous panels. Uh, we are halfway through the 2030 agenda approved in 2015, and we have to remark that with respect to several of the 17 SDGs, we are off track. So, one of the topics of our discussion today could be, can AI be used to scale up the UN 2030 agenda? And if AI can serve in that sense, what is the role of the UN to prevent it from becoming an instrument of digital authoritarianism? In fact, we are now at a second step of AI, that is a generative system that reshapes the idea we have of a human as the only agent of the ecosystem. Now we are definitely understood, realized, we are conscious that there are autonomous agents. Autonomous artificial AI agents that operate with us humans. That's what the Italian philosopher Luciano Floridi from Oxford University, now in Yale, said in his fourth revolution book and studies of humanity. He said, we are at the step where man is not at the center as it was before, but relationships are at the center. So relationships among humans and all the other species and humans and all what is connected in the world that he called infosphere. I am a journalist of uh, Rai Public Italian TV and as journalists I have the opportunity and I had in the last week to meet some of the leading actors of private and public sector. So last week, the two that I met gave me some uh, uh, insights. That was, uh, uh, for example, about uh, building a personalized AI for each of us. It was Reid Hoffman who left the board of OpenAI and he's starting a new uh, startup that is called Inflection AI. So Inflection AI is a sort of toolbox for our pocket and he will build, he will build it uh, himself, not with the public, of course. Uh, the other one is a, a man of, uh, who works in public for, uh, uh, in many sectors, uh, this Leon Panetta. And on his side, he admits that AI could get out of hands of governments. So, we are at the moment where a public-private system, a place of discussion like this today, is not only necessary, but essential. What we told in the first years, in the first decades of technology, also as journalists, we used to say that uh, each technology is neutral and we can use for the good or for the bad. This is not true anymore. According always to the philosopher Luciano Floridi, we are at a point where we have to have it uh, good and if we can use this word moral, by design. Here we come to our panel that is looking ahead to WISIS plus 20, accelerating multi-stakeholder process. And I introduce our esteemed and distinguished panelists to discuss with them on these topics. So, Doreen Bogdan Martin, Secretary General, International Telecommunication Union, Yu Murai, Distinguished Professor, Keio University. Tripti Sina, Chairman, ICANN Board. 
Sir John Whittingdale, Minister of da for Data and Digital Infrastructure, United Kingdom. Maria Fernanda Garza, Chair Oresti and Board Chair, International Chamber of Commerce. Sigborn uh, Geisvik, Minister of Local Government and Regional Development, Norway. Chad Garcia Ramilio, Executive Director, Association for Progressive Communication. Welcome, everybody. And let's start with our first question, that is, what have been the key success of WISIS in the last two decades, and how has its multi-stakeholder nature contributed to, to them? Thank you, thank you, Barbara, and, uh, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's great to see so many friends of WISIS in the room and friends of IGF. Um, maybe if I could just ask, how many of you were at the WISIS in 2003? 2005? Me too. <laughs> uh, I mean, I think in part to come to the answer about the key successes of WISIS, it's, it's kind of the commitment of people, the commitment of people here, the commitment of people online, and of course the inclusive nature in the run up to, to the WISIS um, 2003. You know, I think in many ways the WISIS was actually ahead of its times, um, developing a comprehensive framework that's still absolutely valid today, even when we look at, at new things like generative um, AI. And of course, the WISIS was perhaps the most inclusive consultative process in the run-up to 2003, 2005, including governments, the private sector, civil society, academia, UN institutions. And I think we can't forget that, that multi-stakeholder process and the resulting outcomes in 2003 and 2005 are still strong. Um, and I think we, we, we certainly can't, um, can't forget that. And when it comes to that sort of community spirit um, and, and the successes we've seen with many of our WISIS prize holders, that grassroots exchange of um, incredible things that have since blossomed and scaled, I think is also something we can be quite proud of. Thank you. Uh, you, Murai, which is your impression on this? Okay, um, so, uh, you know, when we, I mean, your question is about two decades, right? Which is the 2003, I believe, that the WISIS uh, uh, started this uh, discussion. So, uh, um, you know, looking at the, like, uh, those years, year 2000, for example, uh, only 6% of the human being accessing the internet at that time. Now it's uh, uh, more than 70%, I believe. Yeah, 67, I'm sorry, thank you. And there's, therefore, the, it's, see, it's, it's from 6% to 70% dropout, right? So uh, that's a, a great, um, great speed of a deployment of the internet. And uh, then, you know, therefore, it's a, a lot of a universal access to the computer network, digital data. Uh, you know, you mentioned about AI, and the AI is based on those uh, infrastructure. Uh, and uh, therefore, that's a great success that uh, without the open forum like IGF, uh, it's, a, it's never achieved on the human being to cover that kind of thing, that's one. And the, <coughs> the um, uh, second question about the, you know, how that uh, multi-stakeholder works, and uh, then from 6% to 70%, and then the coverage of the participation of that space is, uh, you know, when, when we developed the internet, then the internet was for us, I mean, for, for ourselves, but it's for everyone, right? And uh, therefore, the stakeholders are uh, increasing the different diversity types of uh, stakeholders are being involved on uh, this uh, technical environment, which is uh, only could be achieved by a, multi-stakeholder model about discussion or process or anything. Therefore, those are the two key successes of the WISIS. Thank you. Maria Garcia. Thank 
Can you hear me? Okay. Well, th thank you very much for having me here, and um, uh, I'm delighted to answer this question. So, in terms of um, what has happened since um, uh, the 2003, I would say the last two decades bear witness. Just look at the amazing transformation that has impacted the global population. Whether you look at the scope and scale of the internet and its reach today, and you've got over five billion people on, on the internet today, and billions of devices. This has all happened in the last 20 years. When you look at what's happened in terms of consumer technologies, um, smartphones, and all of that was developed in the last 20 years. AI is a product that happened less than a year ago. All this is because of what the multi-stakeholder community, having multiple voices at the table, which allows us to create open standards and open architecture, interoperability. So all of this has um, made tr quite an impact and quite uh, has been a product of bringing this multi-stakeholder community under the information society. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Gelsvik. Um, can I, first of all, thank you for your yes. invitation to join you this afternoon and to thank our Japanese hosts. I mean, it, it is reassuring that uh, I, I agree with my three colleagues who have already spoken. Um, extraordinary change within the last 20 years. Um, in 2003, the internet was in its infancy. The speeds we were t talking about then were a fraction of those now available, and the reach of the internet was nothing like what it is today. And today, the internet is a part of our lives. My children have grown up in a world where they've never not known having the facility of the internet. But there are great challenges ahead, and that means that the principles that were laid down in the first WESIS in 2003. It is a tremendous tribute, but actually they remain as valid today as they did then. And so, as my colleagues have said, the multi-stakeholder approach, the fact that we can draw upon the knowledge, experience, and advice of companies, business, civil society, as well as governments, that has been a fundamental importance in the development of the internet. And that then led to the development of this Internet, government, uh, internet Governance Forum, and we see that as being as important today, if not more so, uh, and therefore we need to build upon the work that's been made, particularly the action lines that were set out uh, as we move forward, uh, because there is no doubt that those principles are still uh, essential if the internet is to develop in the way that all of us want to see. Thank you. Mr. Kelsey? Well, uh, thank you so much. And first, I would like to thank you for the kind invitation to participate in this important uh, panel. And I also wish to convey a huge uh, thanks to the Japanese government for hosting this important uh, forum. Uh, one of the critical uh, successes for uh, WSIS has been the changing of the narrative. It was the first ever clear statement of political will to establish a human-centric, digitally connected global society. The focus was on using ICT to support development objectives. At the same time, uh, WSIS has played the role in developing uh, policy frameworks and guidelines for the responsibly inclusive use of ICTS with the creation of a solid and committed multi-stakeholder community through the uh, WSIS forum, one has uh, managed to increase, increase the focus on leveraging te technology to achieve the goals of the WSIS. And many of the WSIS community are also active here in the IGF and this dynamic commitment has allowed uh, continued dialogue and engagement. At the same time, the UN system has used the WSSIS Foundation to create a strong collaborative network with the WSIS co-chairs of the ITU, UNDP, and UNESCO, and UNCTAD, working to strengthen the collaboration and synergy. Thank you. Uh, Chat Garcia, Ramilo. Thank you, and hello to everyone who in the, in the room. I think um, I, I want to highlight two things. The WSIS was the foundation of global policy 
on the digital society. At that time, it was information society. I agree that you know, the um, spread of issues covered by the Geneva Plan of Action, what we're calling the 10 action lines, encourage a really a systemic approach to in integrating digital technologies into different sectors and disciplines. This in turn created opportunities for diversity in approaches and participation of stakeholders, particularly for civil society. I mean, I remember that time in 2003 and 2005, there was real hope, there was energy, and there was belief in the information society. Um, so there's a lot, there were a lot of uh, participation from different groups focused on enabling people-centered and, um, and human rights-based policy environments, meaningful access for communities in rural areas. The other thing I think that I, you know, that is true here is the multi-stakeholder uh, principle and that everyone has, um, you know, has uh, talked about. Um, the principles of uh, participation defined by WSIS and their practice, especially through IGF, have contributed to an acknowledgement that partnership, only through partnership and collaboration, can we make more effective implementation. And I think that's true today. Although I do have, I want to mention a caveat here. I think these principles are not applied equally everywhere. And I think that's something that we need to pay attention to. There are disparities in applying the multi-stakeholder approach. Not to say that it's not important, but we need to improve that. And we need to remember that there are dynamics of power, there are conflicts of in interest, and there are real difficulties in reaching consensus. So we need to really reinvigorate our commitment to the multi-stakeholder process and to consensus building. But we've learned a lot from WSIS and IGF. We have learned that meaningful and democratic multi-stakeholder partic participation needs to be consistently inclusive at all levels, from, either, from national, from regional, from international level. And I think that's the kind of the lesson that we've learned and the success. And we have a lot to draw from uh, in the next two years, five years from now. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for your answers. and how what have been the main challenges confronting the WISIS process? What plans should be in place to address them ahead of the WISIS plus 20 milestone? Tritisina. Th thank you for, for the question. So I would say one of the um, challenges that we face is uh, conflation. Conflation in understanding uh, where the problem exists in terms of addressing problems. So there is um, well-intentioned regulation and legislation underway that is oftentimes targeting the, the, long, the wrong layer of the internet. So um, the underpinnings and the technical infrastructure of the internet is apolitical and should continue to operate. Uh, it is indeed a common good infrastructure for the entire globe and upon it sits the application layer. So I believe one of the challenges is that there are problems that we're trying to address which occur at the application layer and we're looking at the underpinnings of the technical infrastructure. So that would be one issue that I believe that we need to, um, a challenge that we are addressing. Another is that with this attention now on uh, governance, which is important that we ensure that this the internet governance model continues to remain sound with multi-stakeholderism at play, that we don't forget that it needs to continue to grow and we stimulate the growth of the internet with all the other um, innovations that are at play. Um, as well as there's a conversation underway that um, is multi-stakeholderism working or not and um, is multilateralism an option? Uh, my concern there is you would um, leave many, many voices behind if you went in that direction. Uh, Multi-stakeholderism is the only model that brings all different voices to the table, different sectors of society, which essentially breeds best of uh, breed solutions. It yields those, that kind of an environment. So I uh, that is one, one of my concerns is that we really have to look at our successes of the last 20 years and uh, how this has worked well in our, uh, to, to serve the internet. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Maria Fernanda Garza, so which is your idea of the address 
that uh, the plans should uh, go ahead. Thank you very much. First, let me tell you the International Chamber of Commerce is the institutional representative of 45 million businesses in over 170 countries. And ICC was a focal point for business input since the WISES in 2003-2005 and continues to observe and provide input on behalf of the global business in the WISES follow-up processes, which started 20 years ago and set forward a vision to enable and uphold a global and people-centric information society. The outputs from this process, the Tony's Agenda and the Geneva Action Plan, focus on creating a truly global internet where everyone can benefit from what it has to offer. We have shared a responsibility in shaping this inclusive information society jointly cooperating across the stakeholders groups and our great challenges still remains. While incredible progress has already been made, 2.6 billion users still remain unconnected. And those who have the possibility to connect often do not for a variety of reasons, from affordability to lack of services or skills, cultural and normative impediments and once online, a whole host of other challenges arise. The world around us has evolved significantly since 2003, with new challenges on the governance and the internet leading to fragmented policy responses, also influenced by the evolution of digital technologies based on or beyond the internet. While the multi-stakeholder model has long a very long way, we still it is still not universal, and it is not leveraged properly in all levels of governance. We need to reinforce the model and make it the rule, not the exception, in how we address the policy, the regulatory, and legal space around the internet and digital technologies more broadly. Thank you. And uh, Chat Garcia Ramilo. Thank you. I think I want to add to the 2.6 billion still unconnected, I think that is one of the biggest challenge we have, is the persistent uh, digital inequality and exclusion. And I think this is based on the assumption that digital technologies can enable economic growth and that economic growth equals development. I think that is, um, if we do not look at the, um, you know, how, how the context, I think we will look at this in a simplistic way. Digital inclusion of, of communities for the sole purpose of feeding the market logic worsens inequality, it worsens oppression and, and inequity, and it adds to the environmental crisis as consumption increases. And I think that's a challenge for us all. Unless people have meaningful connectivity, Investment in digitalization will simply not provide benefit across classes, gender, and regions needed for sustainable development. And we do need to connect um, um, WSIS with the sustainable development. I think the other, the other point is the alignment of private and public interests. The WS, WSIS goal of being people-centered needs to be at the fore of any digitalization effort. In 2005, on the eve of the Tunis summit, APC called for ensuring universal and affordable internet access. We argued then that the internet is a global space that should be open and accessible to all on a non-discriminatory basis and must be governed as a global public good. In this review of WSIS plus 20, I think there's a need to call for greater re recognition of the internet and digital technologies as a global public resource, and that their governance should definitely be grounded in international human rights standards and public interest principles. This recognition needs to be backed by mechanisms that enforce corporate accountability, effective governance of global data public goods, and financing for public digital infrastructure. Lastly, I think this also behooves governments to reconsider restrictive re regulatory options and avoid criminalization that reinforce their hold on power that cause harm to individual citizens during times of crisis and in fact impacts negatively on public services. 
we need to draw on the potential of digital technologies for creating more open and inclusive societies and economy, economies. Thank you. And Dorik Bond and Martin, so which, uh, what have been the main challenges and uh, what we are going to face? Uh, thank you. Um, you know, looking back, I guess I would say there are some, let's say, unforeseen advances that we perhaps didn't predict back then. Of course, if we look at 2003 and 2005, we're talking about a, a sort of pre-social media world. No Facebook, no Twitter, no Instagram. And so I think the, the concerns, the growing concerns that we see today when it comes to misinformation, disinformation, I don't think we expected that back, um, back then. Of course, the rapid pace of technology is something else. You mentioned generative AI before. Uh, that's something that policymakers, regulators, intergovernmental institutions, we all struggle to keep up with. But I do think that the WISIS framework still provides the right elements to have this, um, this discussion. I would also say cybersecurity, it was definitely there uh, back in 2003, 2005, but also I don't think we could have predicted how widespread and, and um, how much cybersecurity would grow as a concern. Um, I think it's, it's year on year, 80% in terms of cyber attacks um, growth, that's kind of scary. Uh, so that's something we should think about and perhaps double down as we look at WISIS plus 20. The digital divide, uh, many have, have mentioned. Um, we've made great progress in, in, in narrowing the gap, but of course the third of humanity that is still not connected is a big concern. And we do have to keep in mind that we have covered the planet more or less in terms of 3G, 4G coverage but we still have this challenge of getting the unconnected connected. And I think we have to, we have to certainly um, address that. I think it's also important when we look at challenges to look back at the targets that we set and try to understand why we didn't meet them. Let's take connecting schools. We were actually supposed to connect every school on the planet by, by 2015, that didn't happen. So. Looking back at those targets, I think as we look to the future in the WISIS plus 20 process, as we look to the Global Digital Compact, and I recognize our, our two co-facilitators that are with us, we have to figure out why certain things didn't happen and dive deep on those pieces to try to find ways to make it happen. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, cybersecurity is uh, one of the most important uh, problems we have, and with quantum, it could change in a few years again. So, Sir John Whittingdale. Um, thank you. I would agree. I think digital inclusion is of crucial importance and one of the great challenges that we face, because as more and more developing countries adopt the technology of the internet, firstly, we need to make the case that the governance structure that we have put in place is the best way of ensuring the effective development uh, of the internet. But perhaps by demonstrating to them also the huge benefits which digital technology can bring to development. And perhaps one of the ways we can do that is by linking the action lines which were developed in the original WESIS process to the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. Um, and by illustrating things like as you, you have just said, connectivity in primary schools, bringing uh, the benefits to all pupils uh, of connection, uh, and at the same time through healthcare. So more and more can be done online through diagnosis and indeed treatment uh, via online pr uh, healthcare provision. So these are real benefits, and if we make sure that the development of our, our own principles mirrors that of the UN Sustainable uh, Development Goals, then that is something that I think will ensure that the whole world benefits from this technology. Thank you. So uh, now let's go to the future and uh, try to understand how can and should we this evolve to address the complexity and speed of AI and AI related technology as we mentioned before, for example, quantum for cybersecurity or what's happening with the uh, uh, personalized AI that is even go ahead 
from, uh, uh, from uh, generative AI. Yun. <coughs> okay. All right, thank you. Um, the, yeah, let me yeah, uh, propose a kind of two ways of uh, thinking about the AI and the AI related technology and uh, probably the use. So the AI technology itself and the AI related technology, uh, those are the technologies to be uh, you know, kind of impacting for the future of our society very much and uh, we are expecting a lot of things and uh, your question include the complex uh, AI technology. Yes, uh, those technology are pretty much complex and they are difficult sometimes to understand how it works type of a thing and what's gonna be a requirement to the infrastructural technology uh, to support the AI services. So in that sense, uh, you know, uh, it's a really important, I think, uh, for the uh, process like uh, WSIS that uh, about the transparency, openness, about the development of the uh, technology. Because if uh, technology is going to be a kind of a closed and uh, you know kind of a black box, uh, that's going to be a very dangerous situation. Therefore, the, in order to achieve that kind of openness and the transparency, then uh, you know, technological, international, global standard efforts going to be very important. That's about the technology, AI technology, and AI-related technology as well. And the, another thing is that about the use and the application of the AI. So the, uh, when the AI is impacting their uh, services on the society, then you know, everybody started to talk about the, you know, kind of, but this is, AI and then uh, taking my job or whatever the negative impact of the use of that technology, which is a very dangerous situation unless uh, you know, open and the multi-stakeholder discussion would be achieved. So in that sense, WCSIS is very important uh, to uh, address that kind of issue. Maria Fernanda Garza, so which uh, can be the new challenge uh, uh, and where to address uh, with this uh, in the complexity of our world? WSIS is not a technology specific, nor it's limited to any one technology that was at top of mind then or might be uh, top of mind now. Instead, WSIS set out a uniform vision and offer us a toolbox to cope with the challenges of technology, while giving everyone the opportunity to share in the enormous benefits it offers. It encourages international cooperation, multi-stakeholder collaboration, as well as an open dialogue and exchange of views and best practices. While almost 20 years have passed since this toolbox was created, and new challenges have surfaced, the most important question we should be asking ourselves is whether we have been using it effectively. The multi-stakeholder model is our most useful and versatile tool in this box. We also must approach solutions in a way that they don't fragment the policy space that we work in together. Rather than duplicating efforts or centralizing processes, we should be leveraging existing resources and ensure that our approaches are compatible and interoperable with one another. To bring just one example, multi-stakeholders conversations on AI help the development of the OECD trustworthy AI principles at the same time the private sector continues to dedicate its expertise to develop responsible AI supported through standards built by the technical community, academic research, and grassroots efforts from civil society to ensure accountability and build capacity. And there are many more initiatives, whether national, intergovernmental, private sector led, or multi stakeholder led. Bringing all of these pieces together is why WISE has created the IGF to promote interoperability across of different approaches and areas, allowing them to come together and enhance and inform one another. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sigbjorn Gelsvik. Thank you uh, so much. 
uh, emerging uh, technologies uh, such as uh, AI will solve uh, problems better and allow us to solve problems in entirely new ways. At the same time, uh, AI brings uh, significant challenges and ethical dilemmas that we must take seriously. WSIS has uh, already engaged in dialogues and workshops to manage uh, artific uh, artificial intelligence. WSIS should further incorporate AI and AI-related uh, topics into the WSIS agenda. The human-centric focus from WSIS will be an important addition to the current international debates on AI. Uh, as uh, WSIS advocates that these technologies should amplify rights, not li limit them. The importance of involving the multi-stakeholder aspects becomes more critical in discussing AI technology. Through the dynamic uh, commitment between the WSIS Forum and the IGF, we can spread awareness, increase uh, AI literacy and skills development, and understand its ethical and societal implement implementations. implementations. We also need greater involvement of technical experts and researchers. As AI continues to shape the digital landscape, their experience uh, can provide valuable insights and uh, guidance. Thank you. And Ms. Doreen Bogdan Martin, so you said very well what's the past, so what have we looked for in the future? Yeah, thank you. Um, as I mentioned before, I do think that, that WISIS was ahead of its time. Um, and, and I think that that framework is still very, very valid and we can draw, we can draw from it. Um, you know, I think when we look back, some of those core elements that we're discussing today in the context of AI, uh, things like ethics that's built into uh, to the WISIS uh, framework, security, uh, of course, C5, for those of you that follow the action lines, misinformation, that was also there. And also important things like um, enabling frameworks, uh, capacity development. And I think we have to build on those, um, those elements as we look, uh, as we look forward. Um, back in 2003, when world leaders adopted um, the Geneva Outcomes, it did say very clearly that the outcome was going to be evolving, that the WISIS process, WISIS, was going to be an evolving platform. Uh, and so I think it's important that we maintain the inclusive nature, that we uh, continue to build on this robust, multi-stakeholder process. I think that's, that's fundamental. And something that we have, have done for next year is actually take our WISIS forum that we do together with UNDP, UNCTAD, UNESCO, and other UN partners, and we have intentionally placed it back to back with our AI for Good Summit, which brings together some 40 UN agencies. And bringing those two audiences together, I think will also help us as we look forward to the WISIS Plus 20 process that will conclude in 2025. And of course, the events next year will take place prior to the Summit of the Futures, the Global Digital Compact, which we think can also help be a springboard, a springboard uh, as we look forward to uh, to 2025. Thank you. Thank you. So the IGF is one of the major outcomes of uh, WISIS. Uh, what do you see as its role and special value within the WISIS framework? Mr. Sigbjorn Geldvik. Well, uh, thank you again. Uh, the IGF has uh, provided an uh, appropriate uh, platform for uh, stakeholders from various uh, sectors and regions uh, to collaborate. The role of the IGF is a facilitator and a forum for important discussions for governments, civil society, the uh, academic uh, sector, 
the technical community and the private uh, sector. Its inclusive approach aligns with the uh, principle of involving all stakeholders in shaping the digital future. The fundamental principles, uh, principles of uh, VSIS include us promoting an open, inclusive, and human-centric information society. IGF helps translate these principles into practical discussions and actions. The IGF operates informally and does not pr uh, produce binding decisions or regulations. This allows for more open discussions and knowledge share sharing without the constraints and complexity of formal negotiations. Thank you. Maria Fernanda Garza, so which is in your opinion uh, IGF uh, role? Thank you. As we all have been mentioning, the IGF is an invaluable uh, in its ability to bring together all stakeholders, communities, to share their knowledge and expertise to ensure interoperable policy approaches that meet the diverse needs of everyone everywhere. What truly distinguishes the IGF, it is its role as a convener. It acts as a nexus of all different communities, of the internet and the global digital economy, and it's a powerful attribute that sets it apart thanks to its unique bottom-up model. And as you know, I am also a member of the IGEF leadership panel, and together with my colleagues in the panel, we believe that this unique power of the IGF should be harnessed for policy-making processes at the international level as a sounding board or in an advisory capacity. As members of the leadership panel, our commitment extends to ensuring the IGF is known and recognized across different policy-making spaces. Our role is to act as a bridge between those different policy-making bodies and lift the IGF outcomes to the highest levels of policy. As we look at um, front of the WISES 20 review and the deliberations of the Global Digital Compact, we envision the IGF to become a forum to contribute substantially to the development of those processes and their outcomes, and also remains engaged in their follow-up. Thank you. Sir John Whittingdale. Um, thank you. Um, the IGF has played a central part in the development of the governance of the internet, and we think it essential that it should continue to play that role post-2025. I, I, mean, I am a government minister, and therefore I obviously recognize that there is a role for governments to play in this. But equally, we recognize that those who are responsible for the development of this technology, which is primarily business, have to have a voice too, as do the users, the beneficiaries of the internet, and they are represented by civil society. And it's for that reason that we see the drawing together of all three of these component parts in the overall development of the structure as being so important. And we also want to make sure that we continue to involve, evolve all the other subsidiary parts. So that is the uh, fora connected with national administrations, regional, and also very much to continue to hear the voice of youth. And I, I welcome the role played by the uh, International Youth, uh, uh, Internet Youth Governance Forum. Um, and it needs still to be inclusive as well, so that all the different stakeholders can come together uh, and share their experience and talk about the challenges. So we, are, we remain a very strong supporter of the IGF concept, and we will continue to uh, hope that it, continue to play, it continues to play uh, the role that it has developed so successfully in the coming years. Uh, thank you. Ms. Tripti Sinha. Thank you. At the risk of sounding repetitive, I couldn't agree more with what has just been said. Um, inherent in the IGF is its uh, commitment to multi-stakeholderism and bringing um, various and sundry uh, opinions to the table. Uh, a solution typically uh, breeds an out a good outcome when it is weighed in on by various multi-stakeholders, and that is indeed what the IGF provides a forum for 
just about every segment of society to come together and produce a good outcome. Technologies um, are, are built for people and they bring value to people and you need to then wrap it within policies so that they perform and operate well for society. So the IGF provides that forum and um, uh, I would like to say that ICANN is very much committed to the IGF um, and that uh, our, our participation here shows that we are firmly behind it. And I'm not sure that there's any other way to evolve a technology that spans for this entire eight billion human population that we have today. So indeed, um, I just concur and agree with um, all my, what my colleagues have just said, and the future is young. It, the future is for today's youth. And as Sir John was just saying, I 100% agree with what your, uh, your points on that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Yu Murai. Uh, okay, um, that's a very uh, important question, like uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, value of the uh, IGF and uh, from uh, uh, with this uh, discussion. And uh, uh, you know, the year 2007 was uh, uh, when the smartphone was invented, right, uh, onto the market. And uh, then, so uh, when we imagine the you know, kind of value of the internet and its environment, then, you know, without smartphone, after smartphone, you know, that's a big difference, right? And the so impact is going to be uh, uh, different, and uh, also the industries and uh, you know the stakeholders to be involved on uh, uh, this process uh, has been largely changed. Therefore, the uh, the principle, like uh, you know, kind of openness and the multi-stakeholder, uh, those are very very important, right? And then you know we discussed already about the like uh, about seventy percent of the human being on the accessing the internet. But uh, then you know, what about the thirty uh, percent more? I mean, in order to reach to ev truly everybody accessing the internet, and then you know that's a very much a, a important principle about inclusiveness, right? Inclusion, internet inclusion type of a discussion is going to be. Are very important, but uh, therefore the principle is important. And the last thing I want to address was um, when we started to discuss uh, what's going to be a critical infrastructure of a human being. And then, you know, so it's uh, like a water, it's like, a, um, you know, the uh, oxygen, of course, and uh, then the environment, other environmental issue, uh, climate change, and uh, uh, those are the and uh, then you know, technology is uh, providing a critical infrastructure to this society. And what about the internet? Internet is a computer network uh, and the storage uh, and the electricity. Those are the, basically the digital infrastructure uh, of us today. And so um, the, those are getting to the, you know, uh, because of the recent uh, change, uh, rapid change on the world environment and uh, everything, but uh, then you know, the internet becoming the very much a critical infrastructure uh, for lifeline uh, for all the human being. Therefore, those uh, a human rights discussion and the principle uh, is going to be uh, also a very having a very special value, especially today. Uh, Ms. Chat. Garcia Ramilo? Yeah, what is there left to say about the value of the Internet Governance Forum? We're all here, we've experienced the IGF. What I want to say is that it works, and its mandate should be strengthened and renewed after 2025. I think that is important. Um, but it's not only the global forum, there's a lot of other regional and national forums associated, the intersessional forums, mechanisms, etc. So it is actually quite a, it's, um, sophisticated and, and really broad um, process. And there is, there is particip we can participate at different levels. And I do think that the IGF has nurtured thinking and practice around the WSIS action lines. 
Um, there's also the IGF dynamic coalitions. And in our experience in APC, we've participated in many of these, from gender to co community connectivity, net neutrality. And these have been important in our thinking because we talk to other stakeholders. And that, is, that, is, that really helps build trust, that helps us think of, look at other perspectives, and in the end, be part of the decisions and the policy making. So I think that, to be, just bear witness uh, about how important this forum has been. So let me just tell you then one story um, that, that relates to WSIS in 2003. So 18 years, no, 20 years, eight, 20 years ago, at the negotiations of the Tunis agenda, the gender paragraph was in danger of being struck out. It was paragraph 23, I re still remember this. A handful of us feminists campaigned to keep it in. We literally wore the paragraph on our backs, printed on our t-shirts. Now this gender commitment, paragraph 23 of the Tunis commitment, has morphed into a shared call for addressing gender across all WSIS action lines. In a sense, it's become like, you know, IGF is a multi-stakeholder forum, it's important. Now everybody's calling for gender equality, to be integrated across all the issues. Yesterday, here at the IGF, minus one, we sat down with civil society, states, tech community, and UN agencies to adopt the femi a feminist principles for including gender in the global digital compact. So this is, I think, a, this is how we're able to really make use of the space. To, to broaden the agenda and to really bring change. So again, the IGF works. Um, so here at IGF in Kyoto, we are launching the camp a campaign as a contribution. It's the IGF We Want campaign to highlight IGF's impressive track record as a central space for multi-stakeholder engagement. Please look at our website and just tell us what is it that we want in, in IGF. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Doreen Bagdan Martin. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you know, I think there's consensus up here on the importance of, of IGF and the need to, to strengthen it. So I don't want to repeat what previous uh, speakers have said, but simply to say the ITU is a strong supporter of the IGF. We've been a partner since the very beginning. Um, we look forward to continuing to support it. Uh, Chad, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the digital gender gap piece because that's something when we talk about the online, that's a gap that just doesn't shrink. So we need to really, I think, uh, zoom in here and in other fora on that, that digital uh, gender gap. And maybe just to say, I, I was in New York for the General Assembly and I heard in many different fora, people were quoting Madeleine Albright. And they kept using that quote about, if the UN didn't exist, we would have to invent it. And I think you can certainly apply that here to the IGF. If the IGF didn't exist, we would have to create it. Thank you. Thank you. Now we have some remarks uh, from uh, the floor. So I would ask to Mr. Stefan Snor, State Secretary, Federal Ministry for Digital and Transport Germany, to take the floor. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, dear Mrs. Kafanga, Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear IGF family, it's indeed a great pleasure for me uh, to address this very important panel. And the good thing is everything what I have heard before, I can fully support. And this is, I think, very, very important. And Doreen just said, if we do not have an IGF, we have to develop it. And indeed, we have the IGF. And as we reach, as we approach uh, the visits uh, plus 20, I think it's uh, time to uh, recall the VISIS uh, uh, 20 years ago as a landmark event. As a landmark event where for the first time, for the first time, participants from different sectors, from the private sector, from academia, from the technical sector, and from, uh, uh, from uh, um, the force was, uh, I just forgot it, but you know it, uh, come together and work together with 175 
representatives from different nations on the internet governance. And I think this approach, it was the born of the multi-stakeholder approach, and this approach has indeed proven it worse. And we have to continue to work in this direction. And I can um, say and I can underline that the German government will support the multi-stakeholder approach also in the future. And we want to do everything that this approach is our approach for the future. We have indeed a lot of new challenges. In 2019, we had the privilege to hold the IGF in Berlin with over 5,000 participants. And we discussed in a very intensive way all the challenges that the internet has become in the past. And that we have indeed new challenges. Some was mentioned, artificial intelligence, for example, social media, we discuss about uh, hate speech, we discuss about disinformation. Yes, we have new challenges, but the only possibility to handle these challenges and to find solutions can only be the multi-stakeholder approach because we are all relevant in the internet. We all need the internet. All the different areas need the internet and therefore when we discuss new solutions, we have to discuss these solutions within the multi-stakeholder approach. To address the new challenges, we also fully support the Global Digital Compact by the UN. I think this could be a good possibility to see what are new challenges that we have to solve in the future. For us, it is important that we do not have parallel structures in the future. We have the IGF and we do not need something else like the IGF as I mentioned before, the IGF has proven its worth, and therefore we think that we have to continue working in the IGF, but we have to make the IGF, we have to strengthen the IGF to address all the challenges that we have in the future. So again, thank you very much for this very important uh, panel here, and uh, I hope that in the next days, the result of our discussions here could only be yes, we support multi-stakeholder and we want to continue this multi-stakeholder approach also in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Schnorr. And now Mr. Pierce O'Donohue, who director for the Future Networks. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the panel for those excellent interventions. Uh, and just as we look at the, the achievements in the past, we see the remarkable progress that has been made in, in harnessing the power of the internet uh, and information and communication technologies. And that collaborative spirit uh, that initiated the process uh, from 2003 has seen stakeholders come together to bridge the digital divide, provide online, online freedoms, and leverage technology for social and economic development. Um, and so the multi-stakeholder model, uh, which has been at the center of the process, um, really is something that the EU has been uh, a strong advocate for. Uh, and it has been critical to the uh, development and addressing the challenges that we have seen. The, uh, the fact is that while there have been great advances, we're still faced with problems of connectivity, digital inclusion, and technology for sustainable development. So, as well as the technology challenges, such as AI, as we've heard of, but many others, some of the fundamental problems aren't necessarily just labeled with a technological name. And as we continue with the process, we have to allow the model that has been put in place to adapt. Uh, you've seen already uh, with Mr. Schnorr, representative of Germany, that there is great unity in the European Union, for example. Um, so that in a world that knows no borders, uh, we really need to have a united front. And so talking about the multi-stakeholder model, and again, a, a, a strong sense of unity by all those who are speaking here, we have to ensure that the dynamic system for involving all stakeholders in the running of the internet is preserved. That can only happen if the model itself is allowed to evolve and adapt to the changing technology problems. Uh, but also to address what are some of the global challenges that the 
GDC is seeking to address. So WISIS symbolizes our shared commitment to that. And the WISIS plus 20 process allows us an opportunity for improvement, for more inclusive and even more effective multi-stakeholder involvement. And that includes the issue of gender equality, for example, and other non-discriminations as referred to. In fact, really mapping the multi-stakeholder model against the SDGs, which the multi-stakeholder model can actually provide a ready-made formula to address in a way that a purely governmental approach will certainly not be able to do so. So that is why during WISIS Plus 20, the European Commission, the European Union will be working with the multi-stakeholder community and the other institutions to improve the model in operational terms, to adapt to and to address the new challenges of rapidly developing technology. So if there is consensus here today, then let's all of us here work together in that direction. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Antonio Pedro, Acting Executive Secretary, UN Economic Commission for Africa. It's a video, so it can start. Yeah. Honorable ministers, excellencies, distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor to join you in this pivotal discussion and lend a voice on the critical challenges facing the World Summit on the Information Society process. The WSIS Plus 20 review presents an opportunity to reevaluate and reinvigorate the aim of a people-centered and multi-stakeholder approach to global digital transformation. As we come together to improve the working and impact of WISIS and salvaged SDGs, we must first and foremost acknowledge that we live in a world of digital divides, the global north and the global south. Let me highlight three concerns that Africa grapples with that must be addressed in the remaining of the WISIS process. First, I wish to raise the issue of digital infrastructure divides. Africa remains the least connected continent with only 40% of its population online compared to 89% in Europe. Gender and rural urban divides persist. Lack of competition in the telecom sector results in exorbitant internet costs. Smartphones are prohibitively expensive for many, with costs exceeding 40% of the average monthly income. Moreover, African users pay over three times the global average for mobile data. Second, we need to acknowledge the existing policy divides in governing new technologies. New digital innovations like artificial intelligence, blockchain, and autonomous systems offer shared prosperity, but are predominantly controlled by non-African entities. Furthermore, these technologies lack adequate regulatory frameworks, and governments often lack the resources to support safe and equitable digital transformation. Lastly, we face a talent and capacity divide. Talent development is crucial for Africa's technological advancement, yet only 20% of African schools have internet access. Additionally, access to higher education is significantly limited, with African children having only a 6 to 8% chance of going to college, compared to 80% in more developed countries. With Africa's youth population projected to reach 42% of the world's youth by 2030, addressing this digital divide is urgent. To create an inclusive digital future, several steps are imperative. We must foster competition and digital literacy. We must implement policies and frameworks that promote competition, attract ICT infrastructure investments, enhance digital literacy and skills, and empower marginalized communities to leverage ICT resources. In addition, we need to harmonize global and regional regulations. We must dismantle connectivity barriers, 
by harmonizing global and regional regulations, focusing on areas like taxation, consumer protection, cybersecurity, and data standards. Collaboration has seen in initiatives like Africa's single digital market under the African Union is key to overcoming siloed approaches. Third, we have to champion local content and services as a means of inclusivity. It is important that we encourage the development of locally relevant applications, services and content, aligning with WSIS principles. Lastly, WSIS Plus 20 offers a pivotal moment to reshape an inclusive digital future founded on strengthened stakeholder engagement and coordination. This is in line with Sector General's proposal for Digital Global Compact. By coming together, we can build a more equitable digital landscape for Africa and the world. I wish you a fruitful discussions and look forward to receiving the outcomes of your deliberation. Thank you. Thank you. So we heard uh, Mr. Pedro asking for local relevant application according to WISIS principles. And uh, I ask you uh, a late, uh, the last remark, two minutes, uh, as final message. Mr. Dream. I would say I think multi-stakeholderism is key. Um, driving forward inclusive consultative processes are fundamental. Uh, and of course, our goal is to leave no one behind, which for us means leave no one offline. And perhaps just picking up, Pierce, on your, your points about the SDGs, those interlinkages, sometimes we think of the WISIS as sort of the foundation for the SDGs, and we've just launched something, uh, a report that demonstrates if you leverage digital technologies, you can actually accelerate progress on almost all SDG targets. And so those interlinkages should not be overlooked. And it really, it, it just means we have a lot of work to do and we can do it. And I think it, it will provide much hope for achieving the SDGs. Thank you. Thank you. Sir John Whittingdale. Uh, thank you. So I wasn't present in 2003 at the first WESIS formation. Um, however, I was uh, in U at the UN in New York in 2015 when I was able to speak on behalf of the UK then, and I'm pleased to say that the remarks I made then still, I think, hold true today. Uh, in particular, we see the IGF as being the right forum uh, to, maintain, to be maintained as an open and inclusive process at the heart of the development of internet governance, and I agree with my German colleague that we need to focus on the IGF for that purpose and not allow it to be uh, duplicated elsewhere. Um, but also, uh, I welcomed then the recognition of the importance of human rights and fundamental freedoms at the heart of all aspects of development of the internet, including the governance structure, and I think that also remains as true today, particularly as we confront some of the challenges that we've been discussing, like artificial intelligence, like cybersecurity, like cybercrime, like disinformation, uh, like hate speech. Um, human rights and fundamental freedoms are of paramount importance, and it remains the case that we must respect them equally online as much as we do offline. Thank you. Mr. Yu Murai? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, the uh, infrastructure technology uh, of the internet has been changed a lot and is still changing. And it started from the terrestrial infrastructure and uh, going on to the space infrastructure, which is uh, like a lower orbit than everything to support, provide the internet on the surface of the planet. But the now, uh, we started to discuss about uh, how the, we can, the internet can connect the moon and Mars type of thing as well. And so infrastructure technology evolved very rapidly. And also the application technology like, uh, you know, the uh, social media, um, the uh, cloud services and the smart cities and the uh, artificial intelligence today 
uh, is going to be, uh, you know, kind of uh, also providing a very, very strong and evolving impact to the society. Uh, therefore, the, uh, the IGF and the, with this uh, process uh, uh, to open up for the newly coming the stakeholder, inviting them, and uh, then you know, uh, providing the open discussion place is going to be a very, very important. Thank you, Ms. Tripti Sinha. Thank you. Um, I would say today's discussion illustrates a pivotal truth that multi-stakeholder model is crucial for sculpting our, our inclusive digital future and for bridging the digital divide and empowering the entire world. Um, ICANN is part of this collaborative multi-stakeholder governance models and in, in coordinating one aspect of the internet, the underpinnings of the technical infrastructure of the internet. And we are amongst the strongest supporters of the IGF. Um, I, I would say going forward, let's ensure that we preserve principles. And I would say those principles are inclusion and to ensure that the internet is used as an agency for change, for good, for empowerment and equity and access. Um, I would also like to say that as the global community reconvenes in WISIS Plus 20, let us reaffirm the wisdom and decisions of the past, which have proven to be very successful in these last 20 years. And we must uphold this model because it is adaptable, it is inclusive, and it's in a very effective approach to internet governance. And so as we navigate the future in our collective conversations today and our endeavors must uh, see a vision of the internet that um, you know, symbolizes this you know, equity and equality and inclusivity and empowerment. And as a technologist, I would like to leave you with one note. We've talked a lot about AI, but our digital experience, we talked about how it changed in the last 20 years. It is about to get even more fun in the next 20 years. We haven't even begun to realize how AI is going to impact us. It will change our world. And there's another technology that we haven't talked about, which is quantum technologies, quantum computers, quantum sensors, and the quantum internet. It is yet another change that will impact us quite soon. It's on the precipice, on the brink of innovation. And all these innovations have been brought about by an open internet. So it's served as an innovation platform. Let's ensure that we protect this. And as Dr. Murai just said, let's not ignore space, because there's some exciting stuff going on there as well. Thank you. Thank you. Maria Fernanda Garza. An interoperable ICT ecosystem is crucial to offer truly meaningful connectivity that is also includes access to services and relevant content available in local languages and the skills and capability to transform information into actionable knowledge. Governments alone cannot meet the investment needed to implement these challenges of expanding meaningful connectivity. So the private sector has been a pioneer and a partner in bridging this gap from the beginning and to continue and upscale business investments and enable policy environment is fundamental. And this forum, the IGF, it is the right place to create this uh, framework. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Sigbjorn Gelsbjerg. Well, uh, thank you so much. And uh, WISIS Plus 20 is an uh, opportunity to reflect of, on the digital area's achievements, challenges, and evolving needs. It's a moment to re-evaluate and set new goals for a more inclusive and equitable digital future. While Norway endorses existing structures, we acknowledge the need for continuous improvement and dialogue to address our concerns. The challenges and opportunities before us are more complex and far-reaching than ever before. To navigate this uh, uncharted terrain, we must accelerate the multi-stakeholder process. This means embracing inclusivity in its trust form. We must extend our invitation to those voices yet to be heard, such as a startup with bold ideas, the youth who are digital natives, the local leaders who understand the unique needs of their communities, 
and the experts in different fields. Together, they will guide us toward the internet we want. Moreover, we must renew our commitment to ethics and accountability. As AI and other technologies reshape our society, we must ensure that our multi-stakeholder collaboration uphold the highest ethical standards, safeguarding the human rights, privacy, and security. As we envision WISIS beyond 2025, we must uh, anticipate emerging technologies and prioritize sustainability. Let us commit to reducing the environmental footprint of our digital endeavors, uh, working towards a greener, more responsible digital future. The IGF uh, role in VSIS Plus 20 and beyond is to facil uh, facilitate open, inclusive, and informed discussions on the internet governance challenges and opportunities. Norway wishes to contribute to keeping and developing the IGF as a vital and inclusive format and a meeting place for all stakeholders. That is why Norway earlier this year announced our bid to host the IGF in 2025. And thank you. Thank you. Garcia Ramilo. That's good to hear. <laughs> and I guess two, only two things for myself. Um, the robust, if, if um, the multi-stakeholder engagement for WSIS plus 20 is to be robust, I think and to it, so, that, so that it matches the energy and hope generated 20 years ago. We, we do need meaningful engagement. We in civil society um, are ready. We are, we are willing. But, but this um, willingness, is, it's not only about willingness, but it, it needs to be backed up with support. And I do think that this multi-stakeholder um, engagement, so to be able to really... Um, to, for the review specifically, it needs political will and accompanying resources. Um, there are many different, as we all know, there are many different um, governance structures and processes happening. It's not, it's very difficult to follow all of these. So our expectation as well is that these different processes connect with each other. It's really important. It's not a zero-sum game. It's it, it all, there is space for different processes, but they need to be connected. They need, we need to make sense of, real sense of them. I think Doreen was saying, specifically the action lines connect to the SDGs, the Global Digital Compact, and the Summit of the Future need to connect to what is being discussed here. Otherwise, we will, there's a fear of fragmentation of governance, and I think that's not what we want. What we want is connected, internet governance, digital governance, where we can then meaningfully engage. And again, I would like to say that it does need political will and it does need to be backed up with resources. Thank you. Thank you, thank you to all our panelists. So uh, we heard that uh, WISIS anticipates a lot of, with his uh, multi-stakeholder approach anticipate a lot of what we have seen become the problems of the internet world and the internet governance. And if the, the shift was uh, from thinking humans and uh, other entities and connected entities uh, separated, we see that if the challenge is uh, to put the relationship in the center, uh, WISIS and IGF, according to what they said, is a framework that did it and did it also before the complex uh, situational world we are affording now. So I would uh, ask you to join me to thank all our panelists and invite them to go to the stage there to have a photo together. 